U.S. President Joe Biden is hosting a three-day summit with African leaders. It comes as China is investing heavily in the continent and Russia is involved in regional conflicts. So what does the U.S. hope to achieve and what's in it for African nations? This is Inside Story. Hello there and a warm welcome to the program. I'm Laura Kyle. US President Joe Biden has invited 49 African heads of state and leaders of the African Union to Washington, D.C. Barack Obama hosted the first such summit eight years ago. But under Donald Trump, Washington shifted focus to domestic rather than foreign policy. In the interim, China has been expanding its influence on the continent. It's invested in development projects and infrastructure and issued loans. Russia, too, has been active on the diplomatic front and is unofficially involved in a number of military conflicts. The Biden administration hopes the summit will rekindle America's relationship with African countries, as Mohamed Jamjoum reports from Johannesburg. When American President Barack Obama hosted African leaders at the first U.S.-Africa summit in 2014, many believed it was a great chance for the United States to strengthen its trade ties with the continent and reaffirm political commitments. But in the end, business opportunities turned mostly into a photo opportunity. At a distribution warehouse in Johannesburg for American-owned company John Deere, which manufactures, among other things, agricultural equipment, team members are more hopeful about the second summit. It's going to allow dialogue around the opportunities, the benefits that are um, currently the, the, the companies currently delivering in, in Africa, um, and also, most importantly, highlight the challenges um, to our African leaders that our people on the ground, our customers, our farmers are currently facing. The big question now, just how much can three days of meetings accomplish? According to the U.S. State Department, South Africa is America's biggest trade partner on the continent with goods worth $21 billion exchanged last year. Economists here are optimistic about the potential of strengthening that relationship during the summit. They say the market here is ready for more trade with the U.S., but they also warn that South Africa will have to tread carefully. That's due mostly to China and, to a lesser degree, Russia, at a time of great geopolitical tensions between those countries and the United States. As part of BRICS, a grouping of the major emerging economies of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, the South African government would not want to alienate either Beijing or Moscow as it seeks even warmer ties with Washington. International relations professor Gilbert Kadiagala says during this summit, China will most definitely be the elephant in the room. China has made a lot of inroads in Africa, particularly in infrastructure, and uh, engaging with a lot of African countries. China is Africa's largest two-way trading partner. In 2021, that value of trade hit $254 billion. And while U.S. President Joe Biden's administration is concerned about China's growing footprint in Africa, American officials continue to insist African nations should not be forced to pick sides. The United States will not dictate Africa's choices. Neither should anyone else. The right to make these choices belongs to Africans, and Africans alone. A diplomatic tightrope to be sure, but one the U.S. hopes can be navigated successfully. Mohamed Jamjoum, Al Jazeera, Johannesburg. Well, China has been the continent's biggest trading partner for more than a decade. Data from Beijing shows goods worth $254 billion were exchanged with African countries last year. That's almost four times the value of U.S. trade with the continent, which amounted to $65 billion in 2021, That's according to the U.S. Census Bureau. China is by far the biggest investor in Africa, followed by the U.S., France and Turkey. Well, let's bring in our guests now. And in London, Onyekachi Wambu, a columnist at the New African magazine. 
in Washington, D.C., David Shin, former U.S. ambassador to Ethiopia and Burkina Faso, and a professor at George Washington University. And in Beijing, Ina Tangan, senior fellow at the Tai He Institute and founder of Asia Narratives. Welcome, all of you. David, let's start in Washington, D.C., where that summit is going to be getting underway shortly. What does the U.S. want to achieve from this conference? I think it wants to uh, reassert a, uh, an interest in Africa to uh, in find ways where the United States can collaborate uh, more closely with Africa to try and find ways to increase both foreign direct investment uh, and trade with Africa uh, to do some new things that have not been done a great deal in the past. For example, um, put a, a greater emphasis on the role of the African diaspora or diasporas in the United States. Uh, they are becoming very significant communities, uh, even in domestic politics, with some of their members being elected to various positions in the U.S. government uh, to engage in a uh, discussion on cooperation in space, which is relatively new for the United States, uh, to look at uh, the whole question of uh, climate um, change and, and what the United States can do there. So there's a, a wide variety of, uh, of topics that the U.S. has in mind, and a lot of it will be dictated by the role of the private sector in the United States, which is so critical in the particularly trade and foreign direct investment area. Mm. Uh, Onye Kache, there's 49 countries attending. Each, of course, will have its own wish list. But broadly speaking, do these topics ring true with the leaders of African nations as well? Is that what they're hoping to get from this summit? I think it's always been clear part of the reason China has made uh, the inroads is that the, the Africans are interested in infrastructure um, development. They're interested in the kind of um, transformational change that uh, took place in China over the last uh, 50, 60 years. And that's really the agenda that most of them are going there to, to, to engage with. What they have had um, in, over the last uh, 30, 40 years from, from the US is, you know, generally sort of structural adjustment, um, lectures on human rights and governance, very little investment in infra the kind of infrastructure that they've been asking for. Uh, and then also a lot of focus um, since 9-11 um, on, on security and, um, you know, uh, bases and, uh, and, that, uh, and, and the fight against uh, sort of Islamist, um, you know, fundamentalist uh, groups, but not on that kind of development agenda, uh, the type that actually creates the jobs, um, that transforms economies and actually creates the conditions where young people are not being um, seduced by some of um, these radical forces. So mm. that's, I think, what, what the Africans want to hear. And they haven't been hearing that very much um, from uh, the US, I think, over the last, uh, you know, uh, 30, 40 years. And it's been very much a... Um, and it's um, mood music that they've been hearing from China. Mm. So, David, do you think that's what President Biden is aware of, this change of tone that is needed at this summit? Well, in terms of, of American investment in Africa, it's true that the nature of the investment is different than what, for example, China offers, which is primarily loans, which have to be paid back for infrastructure projects in the United States, by and large, is out of the loan business. Uh, it, its assistance is primarily in the form of grants. Uh, in the last year alone, that is 2022, the United States offered $11 billion in humanitarian aid to Africa. It's an astounding sum. Uh, and all of that is grant aid, none of it's loan money. Uh, in terms of foreign direct investment, the United States has slipped in recent years. Uh, this is a role for the private sector to play. I think there will be a major push to try to increase the amount of foreign direct investment in Africa. And nevertheless, total uh, American uh, direct investment stock in Africa, going back over the years, is just about the same as China's 
uh, foreign uh, direct investment stock in Africa. In recent years, China has provided more uh, flow to Africa than has the United States. But I, I think the main thing is, is that the United States is looking at this as a U.S.-Africa connection, not what China is doing in Africa and trying to combat it. That's not the purpose of this summit. Mm. Uh, Ina, as David says, the U.S. is keen to stress that this summit is not about competing with China in Africa. But, of course, China, Beijing will nonetheless be watching very closely to see what comes out of it. Well, I, I think uh, David is uh, making uh, uh, his, his putting his best foot forward. But hey, he didn't answer your question, which is, does uh, Biden uh, understand that he has to switch tone? I mean, he's he's had the South American, uh, the Summit of Americas that that did not go well. It was a bust. Bust. He had the same thing with ASEAN that he didn't even bother to meet with the heads of state who had traveled to Washington. Uh, hopefully, this will be handled better. Uh, Forty nine, uh, you know. Uh, countries are, are coming. Uh, compare that with 52 countries who are members of the Belt and Road Initiative in Africa. So, I mean, there's a there's a lot of work here. I mean, the way David described it early on was as if, as if Africa had somewhat just come to the attention of the U.S. Africa has been there for a long period of time. Uh, its needs are very well known. I'm surprised that, uh, you know, it's food, energy, debt relief, uh, health issues, how does Africa develop and, you know, how do you get the infrastructure to allow, you know, these countries to do that? It's fine to say, uh, oh, the private sector will step in. The private sector is interested in, in making a dollar. There's nothing wrong with that. But they're not going to build bridges and long-term projects. They're interested in shorter-term commercial opportunities. So Africa is looking for one set of goals. And right now the U.S. doesn't really have an answer for that. Nor does I, nor do I think that uh, Biden ha has the right tone with Africa. And the, the, by that, I mean, just look recently, uh, well, not recently, a couple months ago, uh, when Blinken was in South Africa and saying, I, I don't want you to have to choose. Well, two days earlier, Linda Grenfield from the, uh, the U UN, uh, ambassador, U.S. ambassador to the U.N. had been in the country saying, we want you to choose, choose us over China. Uh, and um, Blinken was roundly dressed down in a very humiliated manner by, uh, you know, one of the uh, minister of uh, South Africa. So, I mean, you can pretend that these games aren't being played, but in the end, uh, we all know that uh, China is the elephant in the room, and that the U.S. is trying to contain, uh, trying to contain China and Africa, and that's the main thrust okay. of this particular. Uh, event this year. David, I'll give you a chance to respond. I must also just point out that, of course, this summit is the first after the first one that was ever held eight years ago. And that is a dangerously long time, isn't it, for the US to have taken its eye off the ball, as the US put it itself, of Africa. And during that time, there have been many other countries who have been stepping in all too quickly to fill the gap that the US has left. I think that's a fair criticism. Uh, it, we shouldn't go eight years before having one of these uh, summits or one of these gatherings. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that the, the American uh, uh, African Leader Summit is, is a very different animal than, for example, China's uh, Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, which meets every three years. Uh, it's not intended to do the same thing. In fact, our systems of government are so different that it couldn't possibly do the same thing. And as a result, uh, whatever the United States does is going to be far more dependent on the private sector. Uh, what the U.S. does is also basically grant-based, not loan-based. Uh, so if you look at, uh, at African debt today, almost none of that is due to, to uh, American loans. It's other countries that, that are involved in the debt issue. The United States is trying to do what it can to alleviate the debt through the international financial institutions. Uh, but the U.S. Is, is basically involved in grant programs. That's why I emphasize $11 billion just this year for humanitarian assistance. No other country in the world even approaches that kind of aid. OK, I know I will come back to you for a response in just a moment. I'm aware that we have not heard from Onyekachi for a while. I want to get an idea from you, Onyekache, whether 
many African countries do feel that they have to choose between China and the US? Well, I think that is there. And uh, there's no doubt that there's, uh, you know, in the context of Ukraine, there's been extraordinary pressure to mm. choose, not just with uh, China, but also with Russia and others. And, um, and you know, that's fair enough. Each, each uh, country has its own interests and the ways that it um, has to, you know, to achieve those interests ends. Um, so the U.S. has its uh, positions on these issues, but the Africans also uh, have their own, and they don't necessarily share, share all the sort of interpretation of what's going on in that international realm. Um, I did want to just pick up on some other points that were were made. I think, you know, there is there are opportunities for the U.S. Um, um, to get this right. Um, the for me, the biggest opportunity was something that was alluded to earlier, which is that increasingly there's now a very dynamic uh, African diaspora, um, a new African diaspora uh, in in the US. Um, traditionally, a lot of um, the uh, policies from the, um, you know, sort of was uh, factored through the prism of the old African diaspora, the 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 historic uh, diaspora. So now there's a, a new sort of complexity with this new diaspora who have um, connections on the ground, who are better able to argue for the things that might work. And I think that's a huge opportunity. Um, added with the old historic of diaspora, I think this could be a, a game changer. It has, it is a factor that the Chinese do not have. And, you know, over the last 20, 30 years, I've been astonished. Uh, part of my day job is to work with an organization called Afford that mobilizes the diaspora for, for development. And I've been astonished at how little that has been um, amplified or harnessed for uh, real productive outcomes. Um, so the fact that it's been mentioned this round, I think is, is, is good. It could be a, a game changer. But Fundamentally, to go back to your issue about choices, um, I just think that we are in a very different place globally, um, and all of us have to work, uh, strike a new bargain with each other. I know it's China limited in what it can offer Africa, limited to funding e infrastructure projects, providing money. In providing you know, infrastructure and trade routes, opening up new trade routes. Is, is that the extent of its uh, offering to the African continent? No, not at all. I mean, you're seeing in North Africa and also in the Middle East, uh, China is trying to uh, develop this, this Belt and Road Initiative goes beyond simply uh, establishing routes uh, for, um, you know, two-way trade. What it really does is tries to take uh, a lot of the elements that were pro profitable in the past in China due to a labor dividend and uh, push them further out, uh, whether it's in Central or Africa, South America. Uh, China has an immense market, immense needs. And uh, obviously, as its economy climbs up into, you know, higher into tertiary uh, territory, uh, it's not going to have going to have the same advantages as it did when it started out 40 years ago. But I, I just wanted a quick retort to um, uh, David's uh, point. And as, this year, China forgave um, a bunch of no interest loans because these countries in Africa would not be able to pay them back. And that was literally double um, over 22 uh, a billion dollars worth of, of loans and things like this. So this idea that uh, the U.S. is standing tall and taking care of Africa, Africa, well, if that had been the case, uh, why hasn't it worked? Um, you know, there's uh, Dambisa Moya um, many years ago wrote a book called Dead Aid, and it basically had a rough correlation that the amount of money that is given to African countries doesn't necessarily become more independent or to grow their GDPs higher. So, you know, at this juncture, China is not, Beijing is not asking anybody to choose. And this goes back to your question about what does, does China has to offer. China is trying to be inclusive. They believe that uh, trade is necessary, that making nations stronger, especially those that it is involved with uh, economically, 
keep creating stability, creating larger middle classes, larger markets, is a rising tide that floats all ships. So that, that's the approach that they have. This is uh, what Xi Jinping is always talking about and which he's often vilified for, this idea that there should be a shared future for mankind. Mm. Uh, David, one of the problems with the grants that uh, you talk about the US offering is it does come with, they do come with conditions, don't they? They come with conditions of human, certain levels of human rights, certain levels of democracy or governance. And this is often seen as quite patronising for a lot of African nations who would rather not have those conditions imposed on them. Do you think the Biden administration recognises that and is willing to move away from that terms of engagement? Well, first, it's important to understand that U.S. humanitarian aid does not come with conditions. Uh, it goes to all countries on the continent that are in need of it. Um, we had huge amounts of aid going into Sudan, for example, at a time that we had sanctions on Sudan. Uh, so that's a huge exception. It is true that there is some conditionality involved with uh, development assistance, and the United States has fairly significant development aid going into Africa also. Uh, but we, we often hear about, well, China has no conditionality uh, attached to its aid. It's true, it does not have conditionality attached to human rights issues or Western-style democratization. But if you look at the economic links, uh, ties to Chinese aid, there is conditionality. You get a Chinese loan, you must have hire a Chinese company for the uh, purpose of the loan, for the infrastructure project and use predominantly Chinese materials. So there, there's, there's a lot of um, sort of looking aside and making this comparison on conditionality. Uh, I, I would also add that on, on the trade side, it's quite true that China has significantly more trade with Africa than the United States. It passed the United States in 2009 as a leading trade partner. But most of that is Chinese exports going to Africa leaving a trade deficit for Africa. U.S. trade is considerably smaller, but it is it has a trade deficit with Africa. So Africa is the, the primary beneficiary in terms of balance of trade. Mm. OK. Uh, Onya Kachi, I think we've got time for one more uh, point, which I will give to you. What does Africa have to offer? Why is it of such interest to global players? Well, by the end of the century, uh, if, if we maintain the current trajectory, Africa will, will have one in uh, four people, if not half the population of the world. So it's going to be uh, a site of uh, interest for markets. For it's, uh, going to, it, it's, uh, what happens in Africa will impact Europe and everywhere else. If it goes wrong, it, it can... It could go very badly wrong for everybody else. If it goes right, it would be a, a huge market for everybody else as well. So Africa is important. And as I say, I think the key thing is for us, you know, we've talked about what's in the interests of um, uh, the Chinese, what's in the interests of the Americans. I think um, we need to foreground what's in the interests of Africans. Um, and um, Africa has had a, a terrible hand over the last 400 years, and that needs to be really replayed. And, you know, what my colleague in Washington was talking about, um, you know, the fact that the Americans provide grants. Yes, we understand that, but um, we also understand that um, so some of the international lending agencies that are controlled by America also demand, you know, like the IMF and the World Bank, demand other kinds of conditionalities which um, then benefit uh, American private companies. And so all of this is part of what we need to look at. OK, and all right. Why, I'm sure it will be looked Africa at in, in, in the has, next three days as well. Unfortunately, we have run out of time and I do have to finish our discussion there. But thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Onye Kache Wambu, David Shin and Ina Tangan. And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website. That's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here, it's bye for now.